Welcome to the Undisputed Podcast. I'm your host, Joy Taylor. On today's show is Floyd Mayweather playing mind games with Conor McGregor. Plus, Ryan Leaf is on set to discuss whether or not NFL teams should be overly protective of their rookie quarterbacks. And does Tiger Woods belong on a list of the 50 greatest black athletes? We've got a busy show today. Skip, Shannon, let's debate. Let's get into the latest with Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor. We're just 17 days away from their mega fight in Vegas. Floyd is the perfect 49-0 in his career, and he's a heavy favorite. But he hasn't fought in nearly two years. Mayweather talked about his age heading into the fight, saying, I'm not the same fighter I was two years ago. I'm not the same fighter I was five years ago. I lost a step. I used to have a 90% knockout ratio. It's obvious I slipped somewhere. When you look at myself and Conor McGregor on paper, he's taller. He has a longer reach. He's a bigger man from top to bottom. He's a lot younger, so youth is on his side. And I've been off a couple of years, and I'm in my 40s. So if you look at everything on paper, it leans toward Connor. Shannon? Shannon? What do you make of Floyd's comments? What do you make of Floyd's comments, Shannon? <laughs> <laughs> I make of Floyd is trying to sell this fight. He realized that ticket sales are lagging, Skip. Now, we don't know what the pay-per-view pay-per-view buys are going to be. We won't know that information until after the fight. But we do know this. There are a lot of tickets available for this fight. Mm -hmm. Now, he's got to convince the people mm -hmm. that this fight will be different than all the 49 other fights that he's fought. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that Floyd Mayweather is a defensive fighter. He's arguably the greatest defensive mm -hmm. fighter of all times. Yeah. So in order for him to convince people that this will be different, he has to give the people an opportunity, give them something that they can believe that Conor McGregor can actually beat Floyd Mayweather. Yeah, I'm 49 and 0, but he's a bigger man, top to bottom, longer reach. He's younger. I had knocked out someone in a very long time. He good. He this and that. Skip, you and I both know Floyd Mayweather would not have taken this fight if he thought for one second he could possibly lose because that 49 and 0, he he fought Berto. Skip, he had no business fighting Berto. Mm. But he wanted to be 49 and 0. He wasn't going to fight anybody that could have a chance because his whole thing was getting to 49 and 0. Rocky Marciano, the great heavyweight champ, was 48 and 0. He's the only fighter to fight and end his career undefeated. And that's what Floyd wanted. Now, Floyd, Floyd now wants a nice round number. It's a big payday. I mean, this fight would have been hard to turn down, but he could have got a big t payday fighting uh, uh, Golovkin. He could have fought Triple G. Could have made him buy probably about $50, $60 million, but not at that risk, not at this record's risk. Mm. You and I both know Floyd has fought one way for 49 fights. That's to get in a defensive stance, and when you come at him, he'll pick you off. Now, if he feels he's behind, he will up the tempo somewhat. But more times than not, Floyd is not going to take any chances. That's not what he does. He's a counterpuncher. He'll pull you in, mm -hmm. you shoot, he throws over the top. Or he comes underneath. That's what he does, Skip. Now, you like, oh, yeah, Floyd. That's right, Floyd. Come at him. And while you're at it, be wearing four-ounce gloves. As a matter of fact, let's just wear, don't even have on any gloves. Just, just bare knuckle like old street. And as a matter of fact, let's just go behind. We don't need to fight the MGM Grand. Yep. Let's go behind the MGM Grand mm -hmm. and just fight, just like just slug it out. Mm. That's what you want to happen. But it's not. And even though I do not believe Floyd will take this fight to him, I don't believe Floyd believes he had a chance that Conor McGregor has a chance to beat him. He going to beat the brakes off Conor McGregor. And mm. you know what? I'm going to love it. And you going to hate it. You know, the, the first mistake you just made is Conor McGregor doesn't have any brakes on him. Yeah, oh, there, yeah. there are no brakes oh, on yeah. that guy. Yeah, oh, yeah, he does. He, he's got no edit button, no brakes. Well, he should no, have What huh? happened with, well, well, how did he start when Nate Diaz got him? Huh? How, the first fight against Nate Diaz. Speaking of Nate fighting Fender. a bigger man, a guy who outweighed him by, I'm going to guess, 40 pounds and had, what, five inches of reach on him and got him on the ground. It's called wrestling, sumo-style wrestling, and he Ooh, just sumo. pinned him. He pinned him. Oh, how'd he get him on the ground? He put them fangs on him first to knock him down. He and didn't, then he didn't knock him. him down. He got a hold of him and dragged him down. Yeah. See, this yeah. is MMA fighting. This is yeah. UFC. All of a sudden, Connor gets to do what Connor has always done very best, what he did against Nate Diaz the second time around when he said, I want him soon. I want him now. When, obviously, Dana White is saying, you can't do this. It's too quick to fight him. He said, no, I want him now. And he got him now because he stood up in the octagon the whole fight, and he punched him into submission, just the way he will punch Floyd. He didn't Floyd. punch him into submission. Yes, he, he, did. he won a split decision, Skip. It oh, wasn't unanimous. It, it was... I mean, a majority decision. It was decision. convincing. 
he outboxed Nate Diaz, a much bigger, much longer man, and he rocked him and knocked him down numerous times. He outboxed a guy that doesn't box by profession. Okay. Much bigger man. What they got to do with it, Skip? You know, back to Floyd May or May not Weather Jr., you, you know what? I have learned a long time ago, don't believe a single word that comes out of Floyd's mouth. That was the biggest bunch of phony <laughs> baloney I have ever heard. I don't know what is he, it was like a mix of Don King and Bob Arum trying to hype the fight by a guy in Floyd who's not much of a huckster and hypester. He's not very good at it. So it comes off as just glaringly insincere and inauthentic. He's trying to hype a fight, as you point out, that the sales, the ticket sales are a little slow because they are so expensive. I think it will pick up as we get closer to August 26th. Well, we might need to pick up our tickets now while they're on the cheap end. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I hope we don't have to buy our tickets for this one. Stop but, being cheap, Skip. Yeah, stop being cheap? Well, I just, I just saved my money, unlike somebody else. You spend it on do. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask you one question before you continue to go? You don't believe Floyd is going to take this fight to Conor, and you don't believe that Floyd believes that Conor has a chance to beat him, but you did believe Floyd when he said he wanted to fight Conor in four ounces or eight ounce gloves. Correct? Well, well, that was just a dare. That was like an open challenge. Didn't he put it on, help me out, Instagram? Well, hell, he, he, he didn't talked. he like type it? He, he did. typed it and put it out there for all to see. Let's wear eight ounce gloves. I'm going to have to take that as his printed word as a challenge. Well, he just do told, it. He was telling you what he's going to do and how Conor McGregor can beat him. So you don't take a man at his word, but you take him at his tight word. I, th that was a dare, but it was a phony dare. It was a fake tough guy dare because you know and I know the Nevada State Boxing Commission rules are 154 is 10 ounces. 10 ounces. Period. End of story. And I told you this is different. This is a hybrid fight. This is MA, MA in boxing. Nope. And the purse strings are controlled by one Floyd Mayweather. Yeah. The He's biggest A5. draw in the history of Las Vegas. That's that's a I just said a mouthful there because he is the biggest draw in the history. Say it, I want you to say this. This is going to be the biggest event in the history of an event town, well, right? Well, say this. He's the A side. See, it. The, the A side is the the global draw that is Conor <laughs> McGregor. That's why Floyd could command whatever he wanted. If he said tomorrow, if he said fights postponed, if we don't wear eight ounce gloves, what do you think Nevada would do? What Nothing. do you think Las Vegas would Nothing, do? They'd say, okay, take it elsewhere. Baloney, they would. Skip, you don't take it to Madison Square Garden. Baloney. Skip, you don't want to start that precedent. This skip. Here's the thing. And oh, I don't. I, you're just protecting him. No, I'm not. Skip. Poor little Floyd. This with is his a, brittle hands. This is He's not got arthritic hands. Skip, he does. Skip. Mm. This is not Rocky versus Thunderlips. This is a real fight. Somebody resume. Now, Floyd wants to be 50 and 0, or Connor's going to be 0 and 1 in his boxing career. This is what's going to happen. This is not Muhammad Ali and Gorilla Monsoon. You actually think this is a joke. This is for real. I don't know the Rocky movies. Forgive me. Oh, you I saw what? the first one, but I wasn't. Well, Hulk Hogan was I'm Thunder sorry. Lips. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah Thunderlips with Hulk Hogan. Ladies out. I'm yeah. sorry. You he's got a, me in he's there. He's a wrestler, though. I do real stuff, but go ahead. Oh, go ahead, oh. You know what? I love wrestling. <laughs> I grew up on wrestling. Did you really? Yeah, I used to go to it all the time. My grandfather would take me and my brother. Did you know it was not real, or? I tell you what, you better not have said that to my grandma. I see I, I got my it. grandfather. Because I, I saw him throw plenty of people out the house when they say it's not real, Barney. <laughs> okay. He said, well, you get the you know what up my house. I respect that. <laughs> okay, so back to Floyd. So he's trying to do this phony baloney huckster hypster, and it was the biggest bunch of poor mouthing I've heard since Nick Saban was trying to sell the media a year ago on how tough their games were going to be against Kent State and Chattanooga. Remember that? Yeah. You hear Nick at his press conference saying, Oh, they're they're a tough football. They're they're deep and they're they got a lot of skill and baloney. So here here's the irony of everything Floyd said yesterday. He was just trying to hype the fight. Yeah. But the truth was, the unwitting truth was, and I'll be the only one who will say this, but he was actually predicting his own demise because I'm buying everything he said, even though he was he was just trying to sell it. But you got it. Listen, every point he made was the blueprint for why Conor McGregor has a great shot in this fight because, as Conor said in all the four media sessions, Floyd, you're too little.
right? Mm -hmm. And there was a great quote in ESPN the magazine the other day, a piece that just came out, and one of uh, uh, Connor's great quotes is that if you tell the truth about somebody, they will crumble. That's what he believes about life. If you just look them right in the eye and tell them the flat out truth that just penetrates to their soul, they will crumble. And that's what Connor was doing in the media sessions Floyd even told his father, remember, yelling across the, the media Negative throng, room. he's too little. He is. He's too little. His hands are brittle. His hand, what, what did Connor say? It's bricks versus, you know, these little brittle hands. Could I catch your question? Do you think anybody has ever told Floyd Mayweather in his life he's too little? No. Nope. Skip, the man is five foot six inches tall, nope, weighs 140 the other pounds. Opponents all had too much respect for him. This guy has no rules, he, he's completely unorthodox, he didn't come from the boxing world, there's no uh, reverence for Floyd Mayweather the way everybody else had a reverence, like this is how you do it and this is how you, you have to have some respect for Floyd going in and even in the press conferences, everybody had some respect, they would all say I'm gonna beat him, but you could tell in the end, they were reverential toward Floyd, not this guy. Skip, it's a boxing match, it's, it's kinda like, it's kinda, look, I look at it like this. Boxers are going to show great deference to all-time great fighters. You don't think they show deference in MMA to Horace Gracie? Of course they do, because he's the starter. I mean, he was the guy that started this. He won the first two MMAs. Skip Harris had got 170 pounds, and he was submitting guys 265. So they're going to show you, great you reverence toward him. You compare anybody to Conor McGregor. He is shattering the mold. John Jones you. is the best fighter no. in MMA history. Okay, this period, guy point is blank. Is is crazy great. John Jones is not crazy. He's a really smart, deep dude. We had him sitting here yes. what, ten, t two weeks two ago. Weeks ago. And I, I have nothing but respect for him, but he's in a whole nother weight class. This is a 154 pound guy who is the baddest man at that weight on the planet. And Floyd's up against something he does not understand, which is amusing to me, because he can just keep on trying to hype. But, but he's actually giving the blueprint, because when he says, I'm old, he is old. He's 40 years of age. Same age as Tom Brady. Yeah, OK, but does Tom box? Is, is Tom, is Tom going to go head to head with a 29-year-old? No. Wait. No. So I, is, is, is Tom going to fist fight a 29-year-old on opening Sunday? He, no, come on. Some of those, but I love, I love how you use age against Floyd. But, but uh, uh, Tom Brady's going to play till he's 45. I get it. Now I'm going to give you this. I, I side with you. Okay, he's trying let, to sell this fight. Going. Obviously, Floyd is a little slower than he used to be because hand speed is everything to Floyd. Head speed is everything to Floyd. This, the bob and the weave, mm -hmm. the ability to duck the punch, to shoulder roll the punch, right? You've lost just a touch of your speed, which makes you slightly vulnerable at age 40. And furthermore, here's the point, has Tom Brady played a, a real football game in the last three years? Because Floyd is almost three years since he had a real fight. Mm -hmm. I'm not counting the Pacquiao fight because Pacquiao had a torn rotator cuff that he had to get fixed the day after the fight. Yeah, he had a torn butt, too, when he left right, the ring. Right, all right, but it was, he was fighting a one-armed man. He should have lost that fight because he, he completely ran from him the whole fight, and the aggressor should have won the fight, and the aggressor was Pacquiao. Oh, let, let's, okay, let me, you said he's lost some speed in his hand speed. Do you think Conor McGregor hand speed is, is still better than uh, Floyd's? I'd say it's on par. Skip, stop right, now, playing! Now let's, get to, let's get to punching power. And it was funny that Floyd said, you know, I used to have this high knockout ratio. And I'm thinking, you did? When? When you were a teenager? No. Because seriously. Gotti, Sean Bay Mitchell. Oh, please. The, the last knockout he registered, a real live knockout, a fair knockout, not the sucker punch of Victor Ortiz. We talked to Victor it on the show. It was a sucker. A man that can't crack. to the referee. How does a man that can't crack eggs knock somebody out? Because he gets a running start and hits him twice when he's not looking. That's uh, how you knock somebody out. That's what happens. Out. The punches you don't see. That's right. how he's going to get Conor McGregor up out of there. <laughs> Floyd, the last real KO he had. Knockout, May 22nd, 1999, Justin Juco, look it up. The immortal Justin Juco. And you're talking about your high knockout ratio? What, what are you talking about? 1999, let's see, it's 2017. That was 18 years ago. Was your last knockout? It was not, saying, Skip. It was. Skip, just because, Skip. If look it up. Just because they don't take you out the, uh, uh, the square, on a stretcher doesn't mean he knocked out Ricky Hatton. He knocked him out. That was 2007. Technical. Knock 
technical. He didn't drop him. You get, he didn't KO him. So what happened? They stopped the fight. They keep him from getting hurt. Ricky Hatton? Are we going to bring up? You, you really going to try to bring some credibility to this? With Ricky, Ricky Hatton, Hatton was the world champion. Did you see what Pacquiao did to Ricky Hatton? It was yeah. a joke. I saw what Mayweather did to I saw what Mayweather did to Ricky Hatton. Okay, I saw so what, what Mayweather did to Pacquiao. You, you I, I can see what you would do to Ricky Hatton right I would now, do the same right thing here, to, right I'd now. Do the same thing to McGregor. To McGregor? Oh, yeah. You, you, you know what? You have just bitten off way more than you can First of all, skip, and I would pay skip, to see that. Skip. Ricky Hatton is 15 pounds smaller than you. Mm. You 170. Mm -hmm. So he won, he won 50, 155. Okay, skip. well, just don't There's bring a him clay. There's a heavyweight clay. He don't want none of this. He can't wear this jacket. Okay, what did it's too Ortiz big for him. Says? That Floyd, this is back, <laughs> this is back on September 17th of 2011? Yes. That's, that's still six years ago. That Floyd couldn't crack an egg six years ago? Now he's 40 years of age. Do you think in your wildest dreams that Conor McGregor is afraid of Floyd Mayweather? No. No. No, 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 no. And, no. and then Floyd's huffing and puffing about uh, the audience. You know, they didn't like the Pacquiao fight, so I'm I'm coming for him. What was his line? I'm gonna go get him or whatever yeah, it was. I owe the public. I owe the public. Baloney. You're, you're not going to, your only hope in this fight is to run, run, run from a guy who has two fisted knockout power. Skip. You want to go engage with him? First of all, he could knock out people at a smaller weight because he was fighting in, in eight ounce gloves. This yeah. was before the brittle hands, you know, he started hurting his hands. And so as he moved up in weight, obviously, there are very few, and that's why people suspected that Pacquiao, because as he was moving up in weight, he was still dismantling people. How does a guy start out fighting at 106 and KOing people at 154? We had never seen anything like this before. So that's why the, the, all the speculation, although he never flunked a drug test. Mm -hmm. But Floyd Mayweather, Skip, his hand speed, is there, are, they, are his hands as fast as he was when he was 29 or 30? No. But his hand speed is still better than Conor McGregor's. Conor McGregor will never, ever have the kind of hand speed skip because he, he can't just specifically train to box. He has to do other things. Now, Floyd Mayweather, all he's ever done was speed bag work, heavy bag work, mitt work, and putting them things outside people's heads. Mm. You know this. I don't now, you know need, this. Now, hold on. Now, Ortiz told you. He said, I, I, I was standing right there. He's like, come on, champ. Bam. Come on, champ. I know you got more than that. Bam. And I'm thinking to myself. No, not bam. Pop. Okay, okay. He's like, pop. <laughs> oh, he's like, crack. <laughs> crack and he's like this guy can't crack an egg and then all of a sudden i was like oh get up i can't he I, got sucker punched that, twice skip that's he's my... trying to apologize to the referee and floyd just gets a running start and hits him you know what if i if you gave me a running start twice and i get to hit you in the jaw as hard as i can swing i might be able to knock you all down. you're gonna do is make me mad skip i'm like <laughs> oh skip i got to get you now that skip first of all You've heard, you've seen situations like, okay, that was a flash knockdown because the guy got hit with something that he didn't see. Skip, it's, it's just like football. You know when guys are like, why didn't that hurt? Because I saw the guy coming. <laughs> Skip, it's those ones you don't see. It's that right, that left, that uppercut that you don't see that comes out of nowhere that gets you up out of there. And that's what's going to happen because Floyd Mayweather can throw punches from a lot of different angles. Mm -hmm. and, ooh, mm. he said he's so gonna be wearing gloves. Do you really gloves. believe that he's going to go on the offensive? No, 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 Thank no. you. But I believe Conor will, and Conor will open himself up. Sure. Oh, he'll be coming the whole fight. Oh, no, he won't. Well, no, everybody start coming the whole fight. And then Floyd get into that defensive stance. You know, he give you a small target. He don't face on, because see, there's more to hit. See, I give you this, and then I hide behind this. So now, I ain't worried about nothing. I got my chin here, I got the right here. So guess what? When I pull you in, this is what, the call, this is what uh, uh, Floyd Sr. was trying to get you to do, just the pull move. You come in, you shoot, I'm coming over the top. I'm going to drag you in, and I'm going to shoot this right, right to your jaw. Pop. <laughs> yep. Mosquito bite. Yep. And how many, how many people does mosquitoes kill? More than Mack trucks? Little old small mosquitoes like, huh, what's wrong with you, Nick Faye, you know? Yeah, if, they, if they're infected with diseases. I, and that's what he's going to be infected with, rights and lefts. <laughs> bloop, bloop, eyes. Shut. Yeah. McGregor's going to be thinking, did he hit me just now or not? Yeah. Maybe he did or maybe you were like, he didn't. I don't know. Ernestine going to be at the fight like, Skip, did he eat Sloppy Joe's for, uh, for lunch? <laughs> My just bloody like a sandwich. Blood <laughs> everywhere, Joy. <laughs>
<laughs> when does that ever happen? Did it's going to be everywhere. Did you see Pacquiao after 12 rounds with may or may not weather? He looked like he'd been to a picnic. No. And I don't mean anything on his face. He looked like he'd had a day at the beach. Ooh. Hey, Jenny already told me. Jenny was here last week. Joy filling in for you. She did a good job. Glad to have you back. Jenny say, can I get her in? I said, Jenny, you in. And at 10, your boy Shane <laughs> on that end. You're, you're quoting Jenny and Joy's presence? No, I'm saying, no. I said, she want to go to the party. She want to go to the oh. after party. Oh. You're not going. Well, I, I, I'm on Team Joy. Though, Ernest, you, know, you want to hang, go have a good oh. time and hang in the winner's camp? Your boy got you, Ernest. You well, not going. It's only 17 days until the fight. I'd like to see some more uh, trash talk get drummed up again. It seems like they like wore themselves out on that. World you tour. go hang with Connor. You go hang yeah. with Connor in, in the ER. <laughs> <laughs> you go hang with him no, when he asks you, where am I? No mercy. Hey guys, before we move on, I wanted to tell you that the Undisputed podcast is brought to you by Barbasol. The biggest thing to happen to Barbasol since shaving cream is also the only thing to happen to Barbasol since shaving cream. Introducing new Barbasol razors. The brand America trusts for a close, comfortable shave now has premium disposable razors. Barbasol's close shave technology on every razor means you get an advanced pivoting head and ultra-thin open flow blades. The Ultra 6 Plus razor also features a seventh blade specifically designed to refine and style tricky areas like under the nose, sideburns, and beard. Visit Barbasol.com and get a $2 savings coupon and see for yourself why Barbasol razors are the number one new disposable razors out there. You're looking good, America. You're shaving with Barbasol. No mercy. The Undefeated came out with their list of top 50 black athletes of all time yesterday. Tiger Woods did not make the list, despite being second all time with 14 majors. Over 10,000 people voted in the survey, with dominance, inspiration, and impact on society being the factors in the voting. We're joined by Rob Parker. Welcome, Rob. What's Good morning. happening? Hey, Good morning. Shannon, let me start with you. Does Tiger belong on the list? Absolutely. 1,000%. Now, I know what he said. He's Kabbalasian. <laughs> but when they took what? him to the police... What? Yeah, he was... Yeah, I thought it was Kabbalasian. Yeah, Kabbalasian. Yeah, what? Something like he, that. He didn't identify as solely African-American. But we know when they took him to jail, <laughs> what box did he check? <laughs> so we know that. So put all that aside, Skip. He should have been number one because he was the most dominant. Because think about this, Skip. They said, we'll give you Tiger, or you can take the field. Wait, you're saying he should be number one on the all-time yes, list? Yes, absolutely. No, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. On the all-time list think, look, above Michael crazy. Jordan? Let me, let, me, let, me fi- let me finish. Let me finish. You look at his dominance. He had what they call the Tiger Slam. He had all four majors, not in the calendar season, no. but he had them all on his mantle at he one did. particular time. Mm-hmm. And then golf. Michael Jordan didn't make little black boys pick up basketballs and go to the black top. Tiger made black men go get golf clubs. Go. Not, not enough of them, but go ahead. But no, I'm saying casually. Yeah, I know. I'm saying casually. He didn't make, he didn't, black I kids didn't it. start playing basketball because of Michael Jordan. And let me ask More you. More wanted to be like Mike. Well, uh, let, me ask, let me ask you a question. With Mike's dominance. When did, when did Nike start sne- selling sneakers? Before or during when, when Michael Jordan came Before. to Before. Oh, when did Nike start selling golf equipment? When did Nike start making money on sneakers? Whoa, 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 whoa. When did they start? Was oh, Michael Jordan oh, oh, when they come started? On. Come I, on. Just, Shannon, you're going to lose that one. Hold on. Yes. They built, they sell Nike golf, they sold Nike golf clubs, Nike golf shoes, Nike golf balls. And when he left the mm-hmm. golf course, what was the first thing they uttered, Rob Parker? We're going to tiger-proof it. They changed no rules in the NBA for Michael Jordan. That was done for Wilt Chamberlain. So let's, let, let, we can minimize all we want to. And let's, he struggled, Tiger struggled since he had this off-field incident. But if you look at dominance, you look at his influence on what he made African-Americans do, mm-hmm. how, do, how, do, how, do you, how do you deny this? Now, what happened was, Skip, uh, I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm I'm tell you. I'm going to tell happened. you. Well, the blacks, because since he said he wasn't one of us, he said, well, okay, we'll get your butt away from us then. And then the whites, when he had that incident, they said, well, get your wet butt away from us. So now he in purgatory. He's got two groups that don't F with him. Which incident are you talking about? <laughs> well, I, well, he started with he had the wife, and then okay, he had to bring the Perkins, yeah. and then... Uh, the, so... The fallacy, what they, what he was trying. Remember, try- he had presented himself as the right. ideal oh. father and, and husband, husband, and all right. of a sudden, National Enquirer just blasted that all. So the now you got the well, he's not black. Well, we ain't got time for you then. And then the white, we, well, we go, he gonna cozy up, and then he got caught in that incident, and yeah. he, now they're out. So now he's in purgatory. He's in the middle. But for him not to be on this list at all, okay? If you want to disagree, I think he could easily be number one. 
but for him not to be in the top 50 of all time, man, this list. So once I don't see Tiger on the list, what, what am I going to even look at who's 30 and who's 25 for? I, I was impressed by the list that Tiger Woods wasn't on there. And it's always about black people, and you know this, Shannon, it's, it's okay if Tiger wanted to embrace his mother being from Thailand and being Thai, that's okay. Yeah, sure. That, that, nobody would be mad at you if you were to say, mm -hmm. hey, I'm black and my mom's Thai. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and I embrace both of them. Yeah. What? No, no, no. He actually had the audacity, the nerve to go on Oprah Winfrey and say he was offended when people called him black. He used the word, res I resent. resent. Right, resent, I'm sorry. And, and when people heard that, 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 that <laughs> sent chills. I, 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 can, I can speak for this man, because I know when he heard it, he was out. I was out, Skip. And I told you that day, mm -hmm. I grabbed all my Tiger Woods golf shirts, True. hats, everything. True story. And took it down yeah. to the Salvation Army. I'm True out. True story. What? Out. Because you know, we used to get upset when we thought people was acting white. Right. Let alone tell you they're not black. If you act that way, we ain't got no time for you. For you to come out and tell us, oh, you got to go. And, and I think this is where black people said, and, and we wanted, mm -hmm. wanted to love this guy. Yeah. Okay? You told us we you, can't you play golf. To. You did. Can't you, swim. Yeah. Can't yeah. play quarterback. Yeah. Can't play in the major leagues. We can't do, we can't be president. We yeah. can't do all this. This guy comes along and, and just blows everybody out. And everybody's in amazement and says, oh my God. Like the greatest golfer of all time is going to wind up being black. This is incredible. It and, was. And then Tiger goes exit. Stage, stage left. Stage left. <laughs> like, like, no, I'm not. And I think that's what. His damage to the black community is what he just got rewarded with and why he's not on the list. He did this to himself. You could blame other people and say the list is ridiculous because he should be on it. No, Tiger did this to himself. Is he not And great? I'll give you the other one. Yeah, he's, he's a great golfer. There's no doubt about no, it. No, so he... He's not on this list. And I'll give you the perfect example. I always say this. Had Barack Obama said, don't count me as the first black president... My mother's white, yeah. just call me number 40, what was he, Four. mm -hmm. 44. Mm -hmm. Just call me number 44. Black people would say, what? Oh, okay, we got you. That's not what he did. He embraced being black. Mm. And I'm telling you, Tiger did this to himself. I applaud people who don't embrace people who don't want to be with them. Mm. I do. I just embrace people. Tiger Woods dominated a sport I love, golf, the way no human will ever again dominate no. it. And I could eat those words someday. There could you be won't. another beyond Tiger, <laughs> but w you're right, especially for those two years through that Tiger Slam period. I've never seen anything like it because just in those two years, remember, he goes, he won the U.S. Open at Pebble by 15 <laughs> shots. And that's after he had already won 97. Only golf under par. 12, right. yeah. And then he went to the British Open at the hallowed St. Andrews, right, the old course, and he wins by eight. And then he won the PGA in the greatest shootout I ever witnessed against a childhood rival of his named Bob May. who was not very good, but it went to overtime. You know, it went extra right. holes. And it was just one birdie putt upon birdie putt upon birdie putt. And he won that one, and then he beat David Duvall, the next Tiger, to come around to the finish it in the Masters. Masters. And it looked like at that point, as Jack Nicholas and both Nicholas and Palmer had predicted, he was going to have a whole closet full of green jackets, which you get to win the Masters, right. obviously, like 15. He now Tiger ended with 14 oh. majors, and I'm pretty sure that's going to be the end of right. his majors. But, four green jackets. But the, but in the point, four green jackets. But again, that's when they sat back and said, we have to Tigerize Augusta National, the, the hallowed Augusta National. Mm -hmm. So my issue with the list, and I don't want to go too deeply into this because it's just the criteria they chose, they put too much weight in the role model part of this. Yes. So you're going to get disqualified. Like, how's Barry Bonds not on this? I, I don't care what he did or didn't do. He was the greatest player I ever saw, right? right? I mean, Barry Bonds, he's not in the top 50 black athletes of all time. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Kobe Bryant not on this list, but we know what happened at Eagle, Colorado. And we know Barry is accused of PEDs, and most people believe, whatever. Okay, so you're out, you're out, you're out. Well, no, you, you shouldn't be out. But social impact is supposed to be a, a weighted category that counts a lot. Well, 
who had more social impact than Tiger Woods. <laughs> he broke down the gates of Augusta National. Not that black golfers hadn't played before. Right. I was there the year, I think it was like 85-ish. Cal, Cal, no, Cal Pete, Pete was in, uh, among the leaders, and they wouldn't put his the name table. on the board, on the leaderboard, in the big board that you can you see, see by 18. You know, they who, wouldn't put his name up. Who was the other black golfer who was, leading, who was leading the Canadian Open, which normally was automatic invitation to the Masters? Oh. And he was he was leading the Canadian Open, and during like at the 16th or 17th hole, they, they sent a thing and said, "Oh, this year you don't get." I don't remember that one, but I do remember Lee Trevino, not black but Mexican American, who despised the mindset of the Green Jackets who run Augusta National to the point he would not dress in the locker room. He insisted on sitting on the bumper of his car and putting his golf shoes on right. in the parking lot. So that should reflect to you a minority view of what that was. And Tiger Woods marched through those hallowed gates in 1997 and blew it away. Yep. And it was it was a stunning, I always say, what's the most stunning thing you ever saw, which you ever watched, and you were on your honeymoon at that point? And you it was know this. What? I should have been rolling in the hay instead of watching uh. it. <laughs> And that's why, because you watch your golf in Japan, most people go to Hawaii and go to Mexico. And unfortunately, that marriage didn't last all that long. But, and maybe that was the start of it. Who gets married I'm and glad. divorced on the same day? Right? It wasn't the same day. Okay, married and horny boo. Is it like raining or something? No, it wasn't. We got sucked in. We were. How, how can you, you know, not? We, you. How can you not sit and watch that? How can she not sit and watch we that? We both did. Yeah. We were sitting there skip watching. Your, your, skip. Let me get it. So when you and Ernestine went on your honeymoon, you were sitting watching sporting events. Ernestine would hit you. <laughs> Ernestine! <laughs> hit him with a two-piece. <laughs> I, I was. That was an <laughs> unbelievable moment. Yeah. But Skip, but Skip, come on. I mean, I, I'm with Skip on this, Rob. I get it. You can, you can dislike the fact that he says he didn't want to identify as being black. But his talent and what he was able to do is undeniable. It's, it's just, and you shouldn't, you, you, see, they're letting personal feelings get involved now. And that's not what this should have been about. Look at Tiger Woods, what he was able to do. He has 79 victories. He has 14 majors, so, which is second in both categories. And, and Nike built a whole, I mean, the golf business. Nike hey, was, I'm, I'm going to go you one better just because I get golf maybe better yep. than some others do. But do you realize how hard it's been for black kids to break through the ranks of golf? Which yes. is why I support First Tee. Yeah. Right, and that's, right. Right. Okay. But it was so hard in Tiger's day. He had the benefit of a father who played, right. and he was in the service, so he got to play at some of the government courses. Courses, correct. But he won three straight U.S. Yeah. amateurs? It's impossible. Yeah. I, I, that's as, to me, that's on par with breaking down the gates of Augusta National right. for a young, I'm going to call him black golfer, to, I'm sorry, Tiger. Tiger, but, he's a <laughs> for, Yeah, but for him to go win three straight U.S. Yes. amateurs, it is hard. And and then that's social impact. That that sets the stage for what. How many black golfers came behind Tiger Woods? Uh, like, let, how about zero? But let me, how about but let me zero. ask you a question. Zero. How many black males started playing golf because of Tiger? I got, I got it. They did. But, but, but he didn't have the impact that I think people thought. It's not him. You got to have talent him. at some I'm point. Just, <laughs> no, okay, but I'm just saying. I that think that, not, that I, underscores just how hard, how hard it was I, for him to right. do what he did. There what were about some Serena? other ones. Uh, Kobe, obviously, you mentioned know. Kobe and Barry Bonds, Allen yeah. Iverson, Deion Sanders, Lawrence the, Taylor, Lisa Leslie, and OJ for obviously different reasons. But some of the same with Tiger were is. also some left of off of the top 50 list. It's always it's personal little, when people are involved. You know that. It's personal. But, it, you know, white people voted on this also. They did. Yeah, but, I, but see, Tiger got called purgatory. No mercy. Tom Savage will get the start tonight for the Texans against the Panthers. He starts ahead of Deshaun Watson, who was the 12th overall pick in the draft. It comes as somewhat of a surprise because last week head coach Bill O'Brien said Watson was way ahead of any rookie quarterback he's been around. We're joined by the number two pick in the 1998 draft, Ryan Leaf. Welcome back. Thank Welcome, you. and you just got back from Alabama where you spoke to the team and to Jalen Hurts. Yeah, I got an opportunity to spend my time in Tuscaloosa this weekend and see the team, talk to Coach Saban, uh, see what they're up to. Kind of gave them a, a talk about my experiences in college. Um, Red shirting, I think, was a big thing. There's a, a lot of entitlement that comes with it, especially being the number one ranked football team in the country perennially. So it was very enlightening for me. Uh, to see the work ethic and the coaches that put that program into place. It's pretty impressive. 
to do. Well, you had some struggles as a rookie quarterback, and last season we saw Dak play really great. So how difficult is it for a rookie quarterback to succeed in the NFL? It's difficult. It, it also depends on where you're at. I think that we've had this discussion before. If Dak Prescott is in Cleveland last year, he's not Dak Prescott. Right. So you're behind that huge offensive line. You have a great defense in Houston uh, to allow a young quarterback to develop. I think that starting Tom Savage for the first game is, is fine. The preseason, though they get reps, is, is meaningless. I'm, I'm a Hall of Famer when it comes to, to the preseason. <laughs> Make my bust right now. Uh, so it's not that important. What they've seen in practice and what they're doing on a daily basis, uh, I think the fact that Hopkins came out and put his support behind Savage means a lot. Um, you really don't know what you're going to get until that first week of the season. You really don't, because I was very confident walking into week one, and defenses are much different when the season starts than they are in the preseason. Did you start for the Chargers in the preseason games? I did. I started from game one. And you would play, what, like a half maybe of each of the first three? My first start was against the San Francisco 49ers and Steve Young in my first game. And I, this is, I went 14 for 20 for about 100 and. 60 yards and a touchdown, and it was... And you thought this is easy. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I can do this. I can beat Steve Young. And <laughs> <laughs> it's, we're going to get rolling here. Yeah. yeah, and then you progress second and third starts just as good. Yeah. Yeah. Started, played really well all through the preseason. Um, got the support of my teammates. We walked out and played the Buffalo Bills in week one at home. Um, we won. I struggled. I threw four interceptions, two of them which got called back on penalties, so really... Really, four I threw, and I think that had had something to do with the confidence I took into the weeks. That I'm like, wow, this is. I was prepared, and they they knew what was coming. They knew what I was doing. I have to I have to get better, or this is going to be a long, long ride. Hmm. And what changed in the real game? What was different? Well, I think they were prepared for what we were doing offensively, um, and the speed. I mean, you can just <laughs> you can just speed. tell. That you know the guys in the preseason, they're just they're working on technique and they're trying to get better because they knew the real thing, the real bullets are coming in week one, and it just it's just not the same. Uh, I used to be able to get outside that pocket and run away from the 300-pound defensive lineman, and now they are pulling me down from behind, and that's that was a significant change for me. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I, I've always felt, especially for a quarterback, it's not when you get drafted, it's where you get drafted to. And Deshaun, and Deshaun Watson went to the perfect team because, as you mentioned, Ryan, they have a stellar defense. They get J.J. Watt back on a defense that was very, very good last year with Clowney, with uh, uh, Wynton Merciless, and they still have cushions. So they have a very talented defense offensively, Skip. Now, they did lose uh, full of the fifth. He broke his collarbone. They're expecting it him to come back. Loss. Yeah, yeah, they expect him to come back because he, he's their deep yeah. threat guy. Mm -hmm. But they still have Braxton Miller. They still have DeAndre Hopkins. They can run the football with Blue and Miller. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're a very talented football team. And right now, Skip, when you look at it, and I felt this is the way I don't know what you think about this, Ryan. I feel if the two guys are close, you start Watson. But if it's not close, you have nothing to lose by starting Savage because you can always come to Deshaun Watson. You don't, you don't want to start a rookie and then have him not play well and then bench him and then go to Savage because you really mess with his confidence. Make sure that because this team is they, – they have playoff and championship aspirations. It's not just good enough for them to be 8-8 eight and eight and, oh, we had a good season and we're growing. That's not what they want to do because they're built to win now. So, Skip, all things being equal, if it's close, I'm going to Deshaun Watson. But if Savage is ahead of him, I'm going to start Savage. And when Sa if Savage starts to falter or we're not winning the way I think we should because I'm going to go to Deshaun Watson. But it's, it's going to be hard if they're winning, even if it's ugly, to pull uh, Savage and, and put Watson in. So you got time. Don't rush it out there, Skip, because you don't want to mess this man's confidence up. I told you before the draft, and I'm going to say it again, I believe in Deshaun Watson's intangibles. I don't think any of this will bother him. I believe in it so strongly that I believe he is another Dak Prescott in intangibles, which is it's, you can't teach it, you can't coach it, you're born with it. Mm -hmm. You can handle it or you can't handle it. And in this case, we saw Deshaun against Alabama in two national championship games rise and shine and play at the highest level against the best defense in college football on the biggest stage in college football. He can do this, but you have to give him a chance to figure it out in the preseason, not to get a false read on what it's like, just to get some reps. 
start to feel it because Dak Prescott was lucky last year. He got a bunch of preseason reps. Romo went down on, I believe it was the third play of the dress rehearsal game. And all of a sudden, they're at Seattle. Seattle was flying that night. They were going to show this kid mm -hmm. what, what it's all about. And I think they were playing at a little higher level than you usually get in most preseason games. And Dak stood in against some max blitzes and took shots in the jaw and completed the pass to his hot receiver. And he showed me some body language and some poise that you just don't see kids have thrown into that kind of a fire up in Seattle against that defense. Correct. So in, in this case, I'm also going to defend Dak because, listen, I get it. The line is really good and Zeke was really good and blah, blah, blah. I get all that. But it's still really hard knowing that Tony Romo is coming back pretty soon. Sooner than later, mm -hmm. he's trying to get back and get his job back. It's the Dallas Cowboy quarterback, which is, to me, it's as hot a seat as there is in pro football, and you know a little bit about that. Yeah. And the pressure on him just mounted from week to week as Romo got healthier, and the schedule kept getting tougher, and it was one game after another in which he had to go 80 yards in 12 plays to come back on the Redskins in week two in Washington, and he did. They came back and won 27 to 23. It's hard, man, to do it under pressure in that seat. That's a hot seat. It, not that the Chargers seat wasn't hot because you were the second pick in the draft and a lot of people thought you should have been the first over Peyton. So you had extreme pressure. And as you pointed out to us, you had no media market pressure in Pullman, Washington to, to get you ready for what, not the San Diego is a metropolis, but it's, yeah. you, you were getting pro a football. lot. It's pro, pro football. <laughs> and you are going to get criticized in your face in San Diego by local and national reporters. So it's, again, Dak Prescott was amazing to me, and I believe Deshaun's built made of the same sort of born winner kind of stuff that will allow you to take those bullets and, and keep bouncing back, not, not crumble under it. That's just my view of the two of them. And I believe that to be the case, too. I think that when you say that, it's not hyperbole where – in Cleveland, he wouldn't have been the same Dak Prescott. It would have been different. He wouldn't have won as many football games no. because collectively it is a team sport. Sure. The quarterback gets a lot of the attention. I, I don't think he would have crumbled in Cleveland. I no. think he would have been okay. Yeah. They would have been okay. They I might have won the three or four games. Yeah, the maturity and the way he was brought up and the, and the adversity he had gone through with the loss of his mother and things like that or the loss of his uh, mother like that that brought him mm -hmm. to the man he is right now. And he is. The Dallas Cowboys quarterback is – the forefront of everything. I don't care if Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, you wear that star on your helmet, you are America's team for everybody to see, and you have to perform well or you're going to get criticized more than anybody. But see, the thing is, is what Dak, Dak was a what, third or fourth round pick? Fourth. fourth. Yeah. They traded up 13 spots to take Deshaun Watson. So he's facing it's different huge. pressure to begin with to start because it's like, well, he's a fourth round pick, and that's what everybody keeps saying. Well, he's a fourth round pick. Nobody saw this coming. Well, you move up 13 spot, everybody's supposed to see this coming. So I, I wouldn't, if it's close, if it's a neck and neck, you know, coin flip, I'm going with Deshaun Watson. But if it's not, if it's not that close. Hey, but how do you know it's neck and neck? I mean, like Deshaun is a big stage player, and you know you've seen kids before yes. who, who, once the lights come on, yes. they're just a little better than they are even in practice. Yeah. I, I think, I think uh, Coach O'Brien, he will know. He will see enough in practice. He'll see enough in – it is not so much that when Deshaun goes in because he's going to be playing against guys that's not going to be started, especially he'll probably uh, – Savage will probably play the first quarter, and then Deshaun will probably take the second and third quarter, then they go from there. So he's not going to be playing against maybe some guys that's going to be playing on Sunday. Yeah. But Coach O'Brien has been around enough quarterbacks, and he's seen enough. He'll know – He'll yeah. know if his guy's ready. You know, it, you brought up DeAndre Hopkins. It surprised me that he said, and I quote, I put my stamp on Savage. And he said, I know because I've been around more quarterbacks my first four years than anybody in NFL history. And it's, it's a long list of mediocrity, you know. But guess what, Skip? Guess who one of them quarterbacks been in the four years? Tom Savage. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so. So I don't know if DeAndre was trying to take pressure off Deshaun. Like, like. I don't know. It, just, it sort of rubbed me the wrong way because I'm a fan of Deshaun, and I, I hoped his veteran teammates would start to be won over, but they're riding with the guy they've been with for three years, even though he hasn't been starting yeah. for three years. This may be an uh, uh, opportunity to build his confidence. You're going to play second and third quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to get a lot more reps. You're going to go against maybe not the most, not the most. talented on the mm -hmm. other side and might build his confidence um, on what he's capable of doing. 
And uh, Coach O'Brien has a plan, you know. He's taken with a lot less to yeah. division titles. But you said it earlier, it's a little different speed once you get to the regular season. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no mercy. UCLA quarterback Josh Rosen has been outspoken about amateurism in sports in the past. He spoke to Bleacher Report about the conflict between being a student and a football player. Rosen said, look at football and school don't go together. They just don't. Trying to do both is like trying to do two full-time jobs. There are guys who have no business being in school, but they're here because this is the path to the NFL. There's no other way. Then there's the other side that says raise the SAT eligibility requirements. Okay, raise the SAT requirements at Alabama and see what kind of team they have. You lose athletes, then the production on the field suffers. We're joined once again by Ryan Leaf. Ryan, does Josh Rosen have a point? He does. I think that the amateurism part, there's a point to it. I, I think when he says something like, you know, a path to the NFL, there's truth in that. You have to go to school. You have to be out of high school for three seasons or three years to be eligible to play in the NFL. This has been documented with the Claret and uh, um, I think Williams situation here at USC. They mm -hmm. tried to and, yep. and weren't able to do it. So uh, there's truth in that. The, the part where it loses me a bit is that he starts talking about Alabama. I think that a lot of people stopped listening to what he had to say when he started kind of taking a shot at uh, Western Alabama and what it takes to get into school there. And I can tell you right now that my SAT scores weren't great, but I was recruited and accepted to both UCLA and uh, uh, university similar to Alabama. So uh, it, it's a, a question about he's advocating for a player is what he's doing. He's advocating for his mm -hmm. collegiate teammates, and it may not come across that way because it's sensationalized in a way by the media that makes it more controversial. By the way, you're a smart guy. So coming out of high school, you got recruited by a lot of – you got recruited as a linebacker, right, by – University of Miami, tight end that, and well, linebacker, tight yeah. end linebacker. So he had the whole package. So, <laughs> did, did did you have aspirations? Were you thinking I'm going to the National Football League as a senior in high school? Yes, yeah, yeah. that was the goal. Yeah, um, I, I didn't know it was an achievable goal. Really, I just was this fantasy of a young man from Montana who wanted to do what he saw Terry Bradshaw doing every weekend, and that was my goal. And the pathway was through Washington State, who had per, produced. NFL quarterbacks. Drew Bledsoe. Yeah. Drew Bledsoe, yeah. Tim, Ro uh, Tim uh, Rosenbaum, Mark mm -hmm. Rippon, guys like that. So that was, that was my plan. And I think that you do. But I got my degree. You know, Did you care about school? My GPA was much lower during season than it was out of season. I can tell you that. I was focused on football. And, it, and the production in the classroom showed. So I can get his point of how they don't go together. But I think it's a great opportunity for young men to learn how to balance their lives because football's not going to last. The average length in the NFL <laughs> career is 3.8 years. Mm -hmm. And I played five and I'm considered a bust. So I think that you can really look at that and go, oh, that makes, that makes sense that I have something in place. And that's what an education does. A scholarship is given to you to get a free education. My brother did that at the University of Oregon. He looked at it as like, I'm going to get a free education. I may not be able to play football down the line, but I get to go play a sport I love and get a free education, and which will set me up for life and not cause my family to have to suffer financially because mm -hmm. of how expensive college tuition is these days. Actually, my grades probably were higher during football season than they were. Oh, but that's just you. you know, but no, you know why, Skip? Because I didn't want to feed into the stereotype. Uh-huh. Skip, when I went to Savannah State, I was in all developmental study classes, which means I could take no classes towards graduating. So I had to get out of all, what? yes, I, the, Skip, when I told you now. Because I, of your. My grades. Your grades or your test scores? Or both. both of them. Okay. All right. I needed a crane to pull them grades up, Skip. <laughs> and they didn't have any cranes at Savannah State. So that's where I was. See, I don't get it because you're a really smart guy. Skip, I, Skip, I was Did bullied. you not apply yourself? I did not apply myself, okay. Skip. And so I was in all developmental study classes. And there were a lot of guys at Savannah State that were in developmental study classes. But they were embarrassed, Skip. Because, because that was like, oh, you're dumb. I knew I wasn't dumb. And the, the, uh, uh, Dr. Joyce McLemore, she told me, she said, Mr. Sharp, I don't want to see you in here next quarter. She said, you, has, you have no business in this class. So I worked my butt off, Skip, but I also understood that although my, that was the first year of Prop 48 because of what happened okay. at the University of Georgia, so they really cracked down on it. But I knew my football ability got me in school. 
my academics was going to keep me playing. Because, and if it came down to choice skip between football and school, I was choosing football because I could make up that test. I can't make up a game. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I approached it. But I prepared myself. But I understood, Skip, from the time I was about 12 years old, the only thing I thought about was playing in the National Football League. I didn't care what position. I said, I'm playing in the National Football League. And I understood. But you had a role model ahead of you who was your yes. big brother yes. who and was he, doing it. Yes. He and was, he, well, yeah. he, he was too. Uh, I was a uh, sophomore in college when, uh, and, well, I was going to be a junior when he got drafted yep. seven overall to the Green mm -hmm. Bay Packers. But I knew that was going to be the path that I wanted to take. And he went to the, a big university, and I went to Savannah State, and I, that was the best decision of my life. But, Skip, it's, it is hard because I got football practice, then I got to run to lunch, and then I got, to, I got study hall, and I still got to, you know, prepare for these classes at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. So it's not an easy task. And so that's why if I'm an evaluator of NFL talent, I'm looking at the guy. I'm looking, okay, he a good player. What did he do with his time? How close is he to graduating? You mean to tell me you stayed there four years and you still – as far from graduating as you did when you went there, I'm going, to be a, I'm going to be a little concerned about that, Skip, because you have so much free time as a professional athlete. Your time is not managed for you like it is in college. Mm -hmm. In the NFL, you're on your own. You pay all your bills. You got to rise and shine. There's nobody coming to look after you. Well, maybe if you go to the Cowboys, you know, Jerry can always have somebody to go look after his players. But, Skip, I get what he's saying. It is tough. And, 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 and we keep saying, because, as you said, the amateurism of it, we say student athlete. They're athlete students. Mm. I just don't love the generalizing, the stereotyping yes. that Josh Rosen just dismisses where you, you know, and I, I don't know what the percentage is, but there are kids yes. who, who have NFL or NBA aspirations who also can still be good students sure. just because they want to be. Correct. Just in their bloodline or their their drive, they mm -hmm. just want to do that. And it's possible to do it, you just can't party, man. I mean, right. you, you got to lock down because you were effectively working two jobs at once, which is not impossible if you want to do it. You can also go back and get your degree. And yeah. a number of people have done that. There's no law, there you go, right? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There's no law and it's free, yeah. right? They gave it to you. No, so I, had to, I had to pay. You had to pay? Yeah, I had, had to, to pay. pay. You now it's grandfathered in where they'll, they'll, they'll actually pay for it. Now the NFL will actually pay for your really? college tuition. Yeah, I had, I had to pay skip. Yeah, me too. Wow. But I say go back early because it gets I harder. I thought you were hallowed there. I thought you were like in the State, well, State Hall. They of State. still accept money. They oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, so they thought you could afford it. Yeah, right. I think that was the big part of it. But if this president would have been the president we have now, you know, he took care of me. She would have taken care, care of you. Me. Okay, so in, in the big picture, I, I get what he's saying because, look, if you raise the SAT requirements across the board uniformly and you, you raise them at my school, Vanderbilt, and at Duke, and Notre Dame, and yeah. Stanford, it would hurt everybody. Right. Now, theirs are already pretty high right. to start with. Right. But if you raised all the, quote, unquote, just sort of public schools, yeah, everybody would get hurt, in part because some kids just don't test well. Right. It's just hard. It's like the wrong requirement because you can have really good grades right here. But don't test, that. okay? But but why is that? Do you get nervous for the test? You might. I don't know. My brain just doesn't work that way. Okay. Yeah. I don't, well, like, okay. I don't like rules. Should that There's too many rules in these tests. Okay. Should that disqualify you from going to college? It didn't. No. If it, it, it had timetables, Skip, I'd have got a, got a perfect <laughs> score. Once we got past timetables, me and math, we didn't mix anymore. Timetables? Yeah. We, once we got 12 times 12, once we got past that, because we didn't go to 13 and 14, but okay. if once we got past that, and I tried to find me a major, what can I get a, get a degree in where I have to do the mm -hmm. least amount of math possible? <laughs> mm -hmm. Broadcast journalism. Yeah. <laughs> Criminal justice. Yeah. Mm. I, 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 Washington State. <laughs> yes, broadcast journalism. <laughs> so, did it work? Yeah, I yeah I just didn't utilize it until my four, until so I, I'm forty. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I, I think you're using it now. I think you learned a lot, yeah. right? Yeah. So. Look, bottom line, what he's talking about, it's a crime that these kids aren't paid for what they do. And I, I don't know if it'll ever change because they are selling to their boosters amateur athletics, student athletes. As you say, it's really athletes. <laughs> yeah. But they're, they're selling this because they put ivy around it and it's like the mystique of these kids go to the same classrooms that you went yep. to when you were there. Baloney they do. But that's what sells on Saturday. Right. 
So I don't see it changing anytime soon, and I still say it's a crime, especially that the football players have to give their bodies up for three or four years, right. or sometimes five years, right. before they go to the NFL and their damaged goods by the time they get and, to the... And if a regular student, if they make some gr discovery as a freshman, mm -hmm. guess what they can do, Skip? They can leave, go sell it. Or if I'm a, a, a classical trained pianist, yeah. or I can play the tube or the saxophone, yeah. I can go leave. But as, a prof as an athlete, as a football player, I don't get those luxuries. Yeah. I don't care how great I am. I can rush for 2,500 yards on 15 carries. I got to stay for two more years. <laughs> you do. And then the final crime is that the r rules prevent you from even having a job yes. on yeah. the side while you're a student athlete. Didn't I would try to work in Didn't we just see that from the young man down at, was it? Uh, UCF. UCF, yeah. right? He had a YouTube channel that was oh, a monetary situation, nope. and now he cannot per be able to play football anymore. You know, the answer for me on this, and, and this is, I've thought about this a lot from the amateur, amateurism side, the scholarship you receive is, I think, payment enough. Now, when the, your likeness and when they're using you for advertising and marketing, which the NCAA does as well as your university, that money goes into a trust that you get upon graduation. Because okay. if you do not graduate because you're going to go play professionally, you don't necessarily need that. Oh, I need it. <laughs> and, if, and if they sell jersey, what about the jersey sale? Yeah, the they sell a lot of uh, 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 Lamar Jackson jerseys at Louisville. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now there should be some way that they get. Yeah, I need my money. I need all that. No mercy. Andrew Luck is still recovering from off-season shoulder surgery and has yet to practice at Colts camp. Chuck Pagano said there's no timeline for Luck to return. The former number one overall pick took the Colts to playoffs in each of his first three seasons, but the Colts have missed the postseason the last two years. We're joined once again by Ryan Leaf, which, Skip, I'll start with you. Mm -hmm. Has Luck's career been more success or failure so far? Given the fact that he was supposed to be the next John Elway, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to go more failure than success. Not that he hasn't had some success, but given first overall pick and given just the idolatry that he received before he came out. And given the fact that I said before the draft, I just thought he could play a little thick-headed occasionally. He, could, he didn't have the greatest feel for the position. He would die for the cause too often. He would hold on the ball too long. He's a tough kid, physically tough, mentally tough. But predictably to me, he turned into a turnover machine in pro football mm -hmm. since his Rookie year 2012, he has the second most fumbles lost in pro football, the sixth most interceptions, and the third highest turnovers per game. That's just not great for the first overall pick. They started out in, in a very winnable division with three 11 and fives in a row, which wasn't all that impressive. And then he took way too much punishment. And he's got cauliflower body to me because he's got one thing after another going wrong. Now it looks like he could be on the pup list to start the year for the first six games. And in the end, he's 10 and 12 in his last two seasons as a starter, which is not great. I feel like he gets, as I told you earlier, too much of a pass just because so many people dug in and said, this guy's going to be great, and they keep waiting for him to be great. And he's been pretty good, which is not good enough when you're that guy, as you well know, from your lofty draft status. Yeah, I, I would agree that there's, there's been some disappointment, but he improved every year. They moved up one round in the playoffs every year until his injury. Yep. Got to the AFC Championship against the uh, Broncos a couple years back. Um, I comparably put him to, to Dan Marino in their first 70 starts, uh, first 70 games. And if you look at it, they are pretty darn identical stat-wise um, for somebody who hadn't won a Super Bowl in a very similar situation, moved up along the playoff run. Uh, Interception-wise, comparably to to Dan, he was he's he's got only 68 to Marino's 80 in his first 70 yeah, starts. So, picks. but he did not get hurt. He Marino. didn't. Yep. And whenever you are not playing, it's what have you done for me lately, lately in this league? And if you are not playing, you don't have the evidence to show your critics. Period. You're on the bench. You can't say anything about it other than I'm trying to get back and do better. And so it's a wait and see thing. Uh, to follow in the footsteps of what Peyton Manning did in Indianapolis was going to be very difficult, and I thought he's done a, a, a tremendous job of carrying himself and performing at a high level when he needed to. Well, I'm going to make it unanimous because I believe he's underperformed because if you look at his first three years, they're 11, 11, 11, so that looks good. But then you look at the division he's in, you're like, that's nothing. I, I compare it like this here. Tom Brady and them winning that AFC East is not impressive. 
but Tom Brady's going to the AFC Championship yep. and he's going to the Super Bowl. Yep. He's not losing in the first round. He's not going to the divisional. He's going AFC Championship or he's going to the Super Bowl. And normally when he gets to that big game, he's winning it. And then you put the pressure on that, look at his contract, Skip. He got five years, $123 million, $87 million guaranteed. Mm. That's lofty expectations. You mentioned it. He was the highest rated quarterback since 1983, almost 30 years mm -hmm. behind John Elway. And then you don't want to be the man that follows the man. You want to be the man that followed the man that followed the man. So the guy, you want to be the guy that followed Andrew Luck, not Andrew Luck, because that was the expectations. Both of these guys were, Peyton was the number one in 98. Andrew was number one in, in 2002. So that's what you're compared to. Everybody knows what Peyton did. It's so great. I mean, he got a wing of the hospital named after him. He was the reason that yeah. Indy went from the Indy 500, a race car town, basketball town. That's now they true. think football. Not only think football, they had a Super Bowl in that, Indy. That's the house that he built. He built. Yeah. He built. So, but the expectations for him is going 11 and 5, 11 and five mm -hmm. is not good enough. Winning a division and, and, and going to, that's not good enough. Because you should, you're the best quarterback in that division. Mm -hmm. The best quarterbacks more times than not. Now, I can see if he's in the NFC South. Because they got a lot of good quarterbacks in that division. So it could go up and down. But when Peyton was in that division, they weren't losing that division two, three years. Mm -mm. They were winning because they had the best and quarterback. The owner pushed Peyton out the back door in favor of and he was he, luck. Man, I thought he was Simone, Simone Biles the way he was back flipping up the <laughs> first three years. Oh, we got us a winner. We got We're gonna have us a lot. We're gonna be the New England Patriots. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't talking about Tom Brady Patriots. He's talking about pre- Tom Brady, because we know what they were then. Mm -hmm. They had some lean years, even with uh, Drew Bledsoe, who's the number one overall pick. So his right now, but here's the thing, Skip, that's working in his favor. He's young. This is only his sixth year. He's probably going to play 15 years. So I don't he, know. The rate he's going. No, well, 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 they better do a better job of protecting yep. him. Because what they've done is that they got some nice cashiers that greet people when they come in, and nobody's guarding the money. <laughs> you got eight or seven million tied up in your backfield, you don't got anybody to protect him. But, mm -hmm. Skip, he can rewrite this. I mean, he could have oh terrible, and then all of a sudden Maybe. he can go on a stretch here. And, and you know. Okay, well, you know me. I care about playoffs. Yes. And you made the point he made these steps in the playoffs. What was his claim to fame game in the postseason was the Kansas City game yeah. at home in which they fell behind 38 to 10. Why did they fall behind 38 to 10? Because he threw three interceptions yeah. that were killers. They were quick score interceptions. Mm -hmm. And then he got hot in part because Justin Houston got hurt, hurt. and Tom Bahali got hurt and Jamal Charles went down and all of a sudden the Chiefs couldn't hang on. Nile Davis went down. It was like one of those rash of key injuries where right. all of a sudden Kansas City's playing with one arm tied behind its back. Mm -hmm. And he did get hot and he was great late in that game and they won 45 to 44. But I thought it misrepresented exactly what happened in the game because it was a lot of he had to dig himself out of a hole that he dug. Yeah. The reason why they were behind 38-10, yeah. he put them there. Yeah. So you better dig us out. <laughs> he tends to do that a lot, though. If you look at a lot of his uh, a lot of his games, he tends to get them trouble in early games, especially in that division when they're playing Tennessee right. or playing Jacksonville. They'll be down by 20 points or something, and, right. and he'll come back, and that lore kind of gets built a little bit more on how well he can bring a team back. Right. He just has a tendency to put himself in that position, like you said. Right. Yeah. His father... NFL quarterback, then a ap prominent athletic director. Mm -hmm. So he came up in around NFL locker rooms. Right. And to me, even when I watched him play at Stanford against at USC or against Oklahoma State in the bowl game, he, he would try to do to, he, like he thought, you talk about entitlement, like he felt entitled on the football field, like I can do this because I'm bigger and stronger than you because mm -hmm. he's, he's a big kid. He's 6'4", 2'. 40-ish, yes. 235, and I can throw up between those two, and sometimes you just can't, and he tries things, or he tries to hang on the ball too long, and then he gets rocked, and I, I don't know. I just, I'm not sure he's going to last that much longer playing the way he's well, playing. He, well, he's obviously going to have to change his style of play, Skip. You, he's not a fullback, and sometimes I get it. You know, you get the crowd pumped up, and you get your teammates like, yeah, and no, like, no, Andrew, don't do that. You slide down, and we're going to punt this football because we have no chance of winning. If you're not playing quarterback, excuse mm -hmm. me. So that 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 that's his only thing. He's gonna have to understand. What did the USC coaches tell me before the ninety was it eight draft about one Ryan Leaf at Washington State? And you'd gone to the Coliseum and just <laughs> just tore him apart. Do you remember this? Yeah. They said he plays quarterback like a linebacker, and I'm thinking, yeah, that, that I, don't know, I hope that works in the NFL, right? Yeah. Uh, 
you, the entitlement of being out there, he was able to do that in college. You yeah. were able to fit it in there in college. And like we talked about the speed, when you get to that level, it changes. You're playing against the best player from every university. When you're playing a, you know, a USC or a UCLA, they're good athletes on the other side, but there's a weak point. You can find the, the fourth string nickelback yeah. in, in the nickel. Do you remember defense. that game you had at the Coliseum your last? We played, we played pretty well. It was the I first time it. we'd won there in like 40 years. <laughs> So it was, uh, it was a special day. No mercy. Thanks for listening to the Undisputed Podcast. I'm Joy Taylor. We're back at the same time tomorrow, 9.30 a.m. Eastern. We'll see you then. Fox Sports. One of one.